let's see lab yeah the lab is due on tuesday i try to give a week for the lab so since i release it on tuesday it'll be due on tuesday and the homework will be due uh next friday that's correct and so uh in my opinion this next homework will be likely one of the most important ones it won't be in terms of technologies obviously like the end project and the full stack applications are going to be far more important in terms of skill set but in terms of giving you an asset to carry over and maintain after this course is done the portfolio that you're building for this next assignment should be your landing page it should be something that represents you in the public domain of the internet that uh, speaks to what your skills are and who you are so it, it's certainly something that you should definitely keep up with after the course is done and uh, and maintain a value for you know cite on your resume link to it on your linkedin account and uh, keep it up to date okay with that said today's lecture i want to go ahead and uh i want to move on from the declarative styling languages that we've been learning which is html css and bootstrap and finally introduce uh, the, at least the basics of JavaScript. So the interpreted coding language that allows us to implement logic and have uh, uh, stateful systems inside of our browser. So up to this moment, one of the challenging things about our assignments have been that everything you've implemented has been stateless. So as you as as so when you were building your interactive story, you weren't able to uh, store any actions that the user was doing to carry over to some consequential action. So now we're going to learn what tools we have so that we can start programming logic. So let's see here today. My lecture is going to predominantly go over the various programming paradigms that are available to us in JavaScript. We'll talk about how we can go ahead and implement comments and uh, console logs for debugging and being able to uh, clearly articulate what portions of our source code does. We'll go ahead and talk about uh, how to declare variables and the scoping rules for those variables. We'll talk about the various operators, the primitive operators, and the uh, or processing operations per you know these two are essentially the same thing. Uh, we'll talk about being able to check the types and then casting from one data type to the next. We'll talk about how we can go ahead and define our control flow in our algorithms, which is essentially our loops and selections. We'll talk about how we can declare fun uh, functions. We'll look at three different ways to declare functions: uh, function declarations, function expressions, and function arrows. And then we'll talk a little bit about some advanced scoping topics. Uh, maybe I should put this advanced scoping, which would be closures and hoisting. And I think we should be able to get through at least most of this uh, for this lecture and prepare us for next lecture to start doing uh, an examination of the data structures that are built into JavaScript next. Okay. So with that said, let's talk about, uh, first of all, let me also highlight before I move on that JavaScript bears no actual uh, parallel with Java. It was, uh, it was a term that Mozilla, uh, the company that developed JavaScript initially, their marketing team had come up with. So current JavaScript actually does bear some similarities syntactically to modern day Java. Uh, actually, if I, had to, if I had to try to describe what it's like to code in JavaScript, I would say it would probably be equal blends Java and uh, Python. I think it's a it's a it's a nice merging of those two languages. But I'll let you make your own decision on that. So first, let's talk about the various pa uh, programming paradigms that JavaScript supports. Well, let's state that first, JavaScript is an interpreted language, uh, and by interpreted language, it's much like Python and less like Java, uh, except for uh, I don't want to get into Java. Java is like a complex case, but it's less like C and more like uh, 
uh, Python. So that means it executes an instruction at a time and we don't have to compile our code before executing it. And so let me illustrate what that means. I'm gonna hop on over to this other uh, Chrome pane. This is empty. I'm gonna to go to the URL bar. I'm gonna type in about uh, colon blank. It's gonna load in just an empty page, which is perfect because what I want to do is get to the integrated browser uh, JavaScript interpreter. So I'm going to go to my, my dev tools. I'm going to go to console. Perfect. Okay, so right here, I don't have anything loaded here. So now I have a nice, clean uh, JavaScript interpreter. So what this means is I can type in to the interpreter, and it will go ahead and instantly go ahead and execute whatever statements I, I input into it. So unlike Java, where I have to create entire source code document and then compile it into bytecode and then execute my bytecode, I can actually use the Java interpreter as a playground and issue statements at a time. I can copy and paste blocks of code and I can play around and kind of poke and prod at the state of my variables and my functions and see and explore how things work. That's one of the powerful things about interpreted languages. And that's why I think it's a great uh, set of languages, Python and JavaScript, to initially learn how to program off of, because it allows you to constantly inspect what's happening. OK, so with that said, JavaScript actually supports four different uh, programming paradigms. And by programming paradigms, what I mean is these are common approaches for you to be able to structure your code base. So it supports an imperative approach, which is just a sequential list of commands that execute in order. So, you know, technically every programming language you've learned thus far is imperative. Uh, in addition to it being imperative, it supports procedural programming, which simply means you can take your algorithm and split those instructions into procedures or functions. So just functional decomposition. Once you start performing functional decomposition on your source code, it's now a procedural approach. Then there's what you learned in Java 1 and Java 2, the object-oriented approach, where you can split your instructions into objects or classes that contain properties and behaviors. And then finally, JavaScript also supports a functional paradigm, which is essentially a collection of functions that do not carry a state. So it's uh, a stateless approach of processing on data where you chain or cascade through function calls. And so it's actually not too uncommon to see one application potentially use all four of these different approaches. And so it, re it's, it really determines at what level you need to insert statements into the interpreter, which is going to determine whether you're going to be using an object-oriented approach versus a procedural versus functional versus an imperative. So we'll identify what approach is being used at different times as we go through the uh, semester, just so that you have a good feel of what these categorizations are. OK, so let's let's move forward and actually get into the nitty gritty. Let's start with the easy stuff. How do I add comments into my JavaScript? Well, comments, and I'm going to try to frame this as a Java like experience. So I'm trying to frame this based off of everything you learned in uh, 1583 and 2120. I'll try to correlate JavaScript to Java in, in that regard. And fortunately for me, this is going to be, I think, relatively easy. So our inline comments are exactly the same as they are in Java. It's just slash slash, and then you could do a comment on a pre-existing line. And the rest of that line thereafter will be a comment. If you want a multi-line comment, it's going to be slash star star slash. Same thing in Java. So that you should already know. OK, let's talk about console log. So comments are good for uh, providing insight, providing uh, information about what's happening in your source code in a natural language way. But oftentimes, you want to use console logs for debugging purposes. And so here, just like you had system.out.print to print things to the terminal, we can print things to our console in the browser using console.log. 
and console.log has uh, two different sets of parameters it can take. You can either just pass in a single parameter, like so, and that could be any type of data, and it would print it out, or you can use a comma separated list. And if you use a comma separated list, you can pass in a mix of any data, and it will go ahead and print producing a space in between each parameter. So the console.log method is super flexible in terms of being able to out, uh, display out whatever kinds of error messages or whatever kind of data values you might need. Uh, let me also say you can look at this and pretty much this statement looks very similar to a statement as Java, right? Uh, it terminates with a semicolon. Uh, let me also highlight the fact that semicolons are optional in JavaScript. So whereas they are mandatory to go ahead and end this statement in Java, you can use them in JavaScript. Typically, it's good practice too to indicate that it's an end of statement, but it is not necessary. The interpreter will go ahead and execute a instruction and assume it'll implicitly add a semicolon if it's missing. Uh, which highlights another real big distinction between Java and JavaScript. Before I even move on, let me just say that where Java is very verbose, it's strongly typed, and it has a compilation step that will report any kind of syntax, syntax error to you before it will allow you to execute your code. JavaScript is exactly the opposite of that. Uh, they have a feature. This is a feature. This is not a bug, believe it or not. It's called silent failures. Um, so it will make implicit uh, um, assumptions to try to get your code to work. So if you have syntactical mistakes, well, some syntactical mistakes, like if you're missing, for instance, a semicolon, it'll go ahead and add the semicolon. Uh, if you have a block of code that simply does not compile or will not... Um, it will not execute, then it just ignores it and it tries to run the rest of your code. And the reason why the reason why the silent failure was a thing was there was a decision that uh, since JavaScript is going to be running the browser and the browser is going to potentially have uh, tabs to several different websites open to different times, the, uh, the developers did not want to handcuff their app's reliability, the browser's reliability, on the shoddy coding of anyone who could launch the website. So the determination was instead of crashing the uh, browser, if there was ever an issue, just to try to run as much as you could and ignore anything that failed. This way you had consistency uh, in the browser to continue running all the other browser pages that might also be open. So it was a design philosophy to silently fail as opposed to be verbosely informative. So. In that regard, it's it'll be both nice to do in JavaScript because you'll get things up and running faster. But if something is erroneous or if something does not work so well, you're going to be doing a lot of debugging. And that's where console.log is going to become one of your good, good friends here. Um, I just want to make one other mention. I'll talk about this when I hit variables, is that whereas Java is strongly typed, where you have to declare every type of data that you're going to use, uh, JavaScript's going to be loosely typed. So we don't really care about having to declare a data type. We'll let the interpreter make an assumption based on the context of what the data is. And you'll see what that, how that manifests in just a moment. So leading to that, actually, let's talk about the data types that we actually have access to. So the primitive data types are essentially numbers, strings, and Booleans, which makes sense. That's essentially what our primitive data types are in Java, right? Uh, numerical data, text data, and uh, Boolean data, yeah, uh, true or false, yes or no data. We also have some reference type uh, um, uh, data types, so objects. And functions are a special case of an object. So a function is actually an object in JavaScript, which is going to open up a whole lot of possibilities for us that we'll see in just uh, a moment. But this ends up doing some interesting things like allowing us to do uh, function expressions or be able to do closures, for instance. So we'll talk about that at the end of this slideshow. We also have some non-types. So just like Java had a null non-type, we have actually two different non-types. Actually, it's, it's, it's three, uh, kind of. 
we have undefined and we have null. And I'll distinguish between those in just a moment. But just know that everything in JavaScript could be essentially considered an object, but you have these like first order objects that are objects, but not objects because they're primitive types because their values are predefined. And those are really going to be number, string, and Boolean. I'm not going to prove that to be the case to you in a little bit uh, from the interpreter. OK, so let's move on from data types. I, I don't think this is anything surprising. It's pretty much what is the same as in Java. So let's talk about these non-types. So we have not just null, but we have undefined. And then we also have a uh, NAND, or not a number. So a null is a null value that represents, it does have a reference that points to a non-existent object. So it's a non-reference or a null reference. So it's similar to the way that you'd want to think about a null reference in Java. Whereas undefined is supposed to represent a primitive value that has not been set yet. So if it hasn't been set, it's undefined. If it's set to an object that doesn't really exist, that doesn't have a value. If it's set to an object that doesn't have a value, it's null. If it hasn't been set, it's undefined. That, that's essentially the distinction. So the similarities is they when both are negated, you can actually convert them into falsy values. Uh, they both represent something that's non-existing. The difference is, is that null represents nothing, whereas undefined is something that isn't defined. Uh, undefined is its own type, whereas null is actually an object. It's just like, it's not an empty object, it's a null object. Null is treated as a zero in basic arithmetic operations. I'll talk about more about what that means when we get to our operators, whereas undefined returns a NAND, not a number. So in addition to null and undefined, in terms of whenever you try to do any numerical calculations, if you ever try to use something that can't be cast into a number, it produces a special non-type which is a not a number type. So, so JavaScript has actually been pretty verbose in trying to describe the various non-types of data that can be assigned to a particular value. Okay, so now let's talk about how we can actually implement these data types in JavaScript. So, uh, just like in Java, strings are objects used to uh, represent and manipulate a sequence of characters. A basic string could be represented either with double quotations and then all the text in between there, just like we're used to, or it could be represented with single quotations. There's no concept of a car here, so you're free to use either the double or single quotation. The trick is you have to be consistent. So if you start with the double, you have to end with the double. If you start with the single, you got to end with the single. The powerful thing about this is it allows you to blend the two. So if you need to, for some reason, have double quotations embedded into your string, then you should use single quotations so that you can get the double quotation embedded without breaking the string. Similar, if you want to have the single quotations in the string, make sure that you uh, end and begin the string with double quotations. So there's another type of way we can also define strings. It's the ticks, the same ticks we use inside of Slack. It's you know the alternate tilde key, uh, if you're not familiar with the tick. So if you have a tick to open and close, it allows you to actually use both double and single quotes in a single string. Actually, though, string templates are, in terms of Java, would be the closest things we have to formatted strings. So you can actually embed data or variables or expressions or function calls into a string as long as you're using a string template by using a dollar sign and then curly braces. And then any, any statement you put in between these curly braces would actually be executed by the JavaScript interpreter and then passed into a string and then it would be embedded into the string. Now, one powerful thing, another powerful thing about these tick uh, or these string templates is that it also preserves all the original formatting that was inside of that, uh, that's inside of the string. So whereas the double quotations or the single quotations actually uh, remove new line characters or tabs or spaces, well, not spaces, but new line characters and, and well, I don't know about that. Well, at least new line characters. 
it removes your new line characters, uh, the ticks will preserve that. And in fact, this is a this is a feature that's also string templates are also something that's available in Python, and they're also something that is coming to Java in its newest release. It might already be in beta right now. So this is it's just a, a more verbose way of handling uh, text and, and, and being able to preserve the original uh, components, both the, not just the text itself, but the format instructions for it. Okay, so done with strings. Let's talk about numbers now. So there's only one number type or technically it's an object, but I'll, I'll, I want to distinguish it from an object and call it like a primitive type. Uh, and so we'll, we'll see how that again manifests later. But for now, I'll say that numbers are used to represent and manipulate numbers. And we don't have to distinguish between floating point numbers and um, de uh, integer numbers. And so uh, they're treated both the same. They're just treated as the data type number. And so actually, I like the way that both JavaScript and Python handles numbers more so than Java, where Java is very verbose about what your min and max range is on a number, because it's either going to be 32-bit uh, or 64-bit precision. JavaScript allows an arbitrarily sized, uh, arbitrarily large number. We'll see that on the next slide. But so you could just uh, declare you know, float type, uh, integer type in decimal format. You can also do um, binary encoding. So if you start your number with zero and then B, and then whatever values you give after that, it will encode it as a binary or treat it as a binary number. If you do zero O, it'll treat it as an octal number. If you do zero X, you could uh, input a hexadecimal number. And so any of your arithmetic operations can go ahead and be applied in any one of those bases. You can also express your numbers in scientific notation. And so here, just to give you an example, if I wanted to do this, suppose I wanted to take, let me refresh my page here, do 0xff plus 0b1011 plus 0077 plus Let's do a scientific number. I can express the, oh, you know, let's do an integer as well. And uh, why not a, uh, um, a floating point? There we go. And that's going to be our result. So you can see it's, it's really expressive in all the different ways that we can present our number depending on what our use case is. And then we can also generate not a number. Not a number is if we, say, try to cast a, the letter A, right, into a number. Now, if I preface that with 0x, now suddenly that can be a number because that's a hexadecimal encoding. Okay. And so that's kind of a special non-type, which allows us to do interesting things. We'll see this more, but I could do like one plus uh, A here, and you'll see that'll do concatenation. It won't be, but if I do minus A, instead of crashing on me, it can actually produce a result, a numerical result, and that numerical result is not a number. Okay, so I said that uh, one of the nice things about our numbers is they can be arbitrarily large. So I went in to the console to show you quite how big this number can be before it has to convert into infinity. So you can have a number that's this big times 1.79 before it gets to infinity. And just to give you an idea of how powerful that is, I could take something that's really big and multiply it by something, oh no, that's gotta have numbers in it to, to work, right? And I can get a result right there. So again, super, super flexible with the way that it handles numbers. Uh, another nice feature about JavaScript is uh, Boolean objects, which you should be familiar with, you know, true, false values. We can actually cast any type of data into having a Boolean representation. So this is, this is the takeaway. And I'll give you these slides so you can use these as a resource. If you have the number zero or minus zero or null or false, 
or not a number or undefined or an empty string, then that all will cast into a falsy value as a, as a Boolean representation. All other values, including any object, even if the object is empty, or any array, even if the array is empty, or any string that is non-empty, even if your string says false, it contains text, all those will resolve as true. So please keep that in mind. Don't make the mistake of passing something into Boolean and saying, oh, well, this is false because it'll actually be true. If you want that to be false, it has to be the empty string. Or more precisely, if we would make that easier, we could do this to cast or empty string, just like so. Okay, let's refresh. Okay, now that we've seen how we can get uh, literal values of our primitive data types, which is our Boolean, our number, and our string, let's talk about how we can declare variables to hold those values. Super important if we're going to build software. So there are three key words we can use to declare a variable. We could use var, we can use lit, and we could use const. Const is short for constant. So you know that's going to be an immutable value. It's going to be read only. Uh, lit and var are going to be mutable. So essentially, this is the, the, the distinctions between these three is var is function scoped. It allows redeclarations and it allows overwrites. Let is block scoped. You does not allow for any redeclarations, but it does allow to be override. It is mutable. Uh, constant or const is block scoped. It doesn't allow for redeclarations, and it does not allow for overriding. The basic rule of thumb is you always use the least privilege as possible. It's the basic security met metric you use for for anything. Uh, like access to your computer, access to a file, access to um, uh, access to data in your software system. The motivation should always be to ins to to inspect the thing you're assigning and say, can this be a const? Will it ever change throughout the execution of my application? If it does not, if it will not mutate, use the const. It's the safest way to go to ensure for consistency across the execution of your application. Then you would use let, which is block scoped. And finally, you would use var, which is function scoped. So we're going to talk about what it means to be function scoped versus block scoped. Now, redeclaration, you should have an indication of based off of what the word declaration means. Overwriting, you should definitely know what that means, being able to mutate or write to the uh, memory space. Okay, let's talk about redeclaration. So redeclaration means that I can declare the same variable twice in essentially the same scope. So if I had, let's look at this first example. If I had a var x assigned to 10, and then I did a var x assigned to 100, I can go ahead, execute that code. It says undefined. That means that it, it worked. If I were to inspect x, it would actually have the value of 100. So I can actually redeclare that same variable name uh, more than once, which is super dangerous. That's super dangerous because maybe X was holding some data that I needed, and I just accidentally overwrote it because I didn't realize I used that name already. So let's look at lit. Lit is just like var in the ability to declare a variable and store a uh, value into it. Also notice, look, no data types are defined here. I just declare that I need a memory location and it, it determines what type of data is going to be stored there. OK, so let's look at uh, the let. I'm going to try to declare, declare let twice and notice it's going to generate the syntax error. Identifier x has already been declared. So this is why we like let. It allows us safety and preventing us from doing something stupid. OK, let's also now not break let so we can see how that works. So we're going to be inside of a code block. Code blocks, just like in Java, are defined with open and uh, closed curly braces. I'm going to declare a variable x using the let keyword. I'm going to assign it 10, and then I'm going to override it with 100. So now after it's done uh, executing this block, it shows that I do have a value of 100 there. So that illustrates that it is um, it can't be redeclared but it can be overridden. 
Now let's take a look at const. I'm going to declare const as x is assigned 10, then try to redeclare it with 100. It's going to throw this error. Identifier x has already been declared. OK, so that just illustrates that I can't redeclare it. So let's not try to redeclare it, but re overwrite the value or reassign the value. So we'll declare const x equal to 10 or assign 10, and then we will reassign it with 100, and we'll get this new error message, assignment to constant variable cannot be done. It's a type error. OK. So now let's talk about block scopes. We talked about what it means to have redeclarations and that var supports it, but both let and const does not. So let's talk about block scopes. So I have a block here, right? Open, close, curly brace. I'm going to go ahead and define a variable inside this block. And then outside the block, I'm going to try to access that variable. And look at this. I can access that. That's perfectly fine because, because that's what it means to have a variable declared as a var is that it has function scope. And what that means is that it gets defined, the, that variable gets defined within the nearest function that is declared within. And functions are special types of objects. So we'll see what that means in terms of the browser's global scope. So if it's not declared in a function, so this isn't technically declared in a function, which means that it's going to become a member of the global scope. And the global scope will be a variable that can be accessed anywhere in your application from any function. It's, and so the global scope is actually part of the window object. That's the initial object that gets launched whenever you open your browser. Uh, so let's define a scope here using the let keyword, we'll assign y here 100 and then try to access it outside. And this is exactly what we would expect. So let gives you an, uh, an equivalent scoping rules as what you'd expect from Java. So this is what you want to use. You want to use lets and, and, and cons. You want to avoid vars unless you absolutely need to use them. And if you try to access this outside block scope, it will throw this uncaught reference error uh, for you, where y is not defined, because it was defined inside the scope here, not inside the scope outside of, uh, not defined outside that scope with the set of curly braces. And you'll get the exact same error if you try to do that with constant. So just illustration that this is what it means to be a block uh, scope. This is block scope. This is the, uh, this is the function scope. So function scope is going to mean that any var that's declared within a function only exists in that function. So it's, it's safe as long as it's defined in the function. If it's not defined in a function, then it becomes a member of your global space. And I'll show you what that looks like. So, OK, so what is scope? Scope determines the visibility or accessibility of a variable or other resource in the area of your code. You should already know this. And we're just going to say that scopes are defined by curly braces. So let's talk about the global scope really quick. So I'm going to hop back over here. So I can do this. I can do bar. Uh, I'm going to do underscore A is equal to 10. And then I'm going to do this other thing. I do underscore B is equal to um, 1. Perfect. OK, and that works too. And, and so you might be wondering, well, how can I create a uh, variable without using the keyword vars? Because I'm actually inside of a window object. I can actually. I can actually use it, since it's an object, I'm actually interacting within the object window. If I type in this, it'll actually show me the window object that this points to. So just like in, uh, we'll, uh, we'll cover this when we hit OOP portions of JavaScript, but I can use this keyword to reference or dereference whatever the this pointer is pointing to, whatever object that this uh, pointer is pointing to, whatever the instance that this pointer is pointing to. And so if I unpack my window here, everything that I can do inside this HTML document is defined inside the window object. And so this is where the global scope would be. I'd say, notice what's been added to my window instance is in the global space, that underscore A, which is 10, my underscore B, which is 1. So if you have a variable that's not put into a function, this is where it goes. It goes into your global space, which is the window object. And then we'll just collapse that again. I'll, let me also say that the uh, dev tools, super powerful for auto completion, for inspection of everything that's happening within the state of your client side code. 
So we will be learning how to use the uh, dev tools and the console here uh, very much as we continue to develop our client side code. Okay, so we talked about the global scope. There's only one global scope. It's the area outside all the functions uh, and any variables that are declared not in a function go into that space. And so that's also a dangerous place. That means that that, uh, that, that data is essentially as public as it can get. It's, a, it's available to everything. Then let's talk about uh, function scope. So function scope means that if you declare a variable within the curly braces of a function, it actually only exists within that function. So again, if you are going to use vars, you should try to ensure that they exist within a function unless you absolutely have to have shared data that uh, goes across the entirety of your application. And so here, we'll talk about this more. You can actually have nested functions. And the reason why we can have nested functions is because functions are objects. So here we have function one, and actually function two is defined in function one, and so those would have nested scopes. So a variable declared in function two would not be uh, accessible in function uh, one, but a variable that's declared in function one here would be available in function two because it has is because it's a parent. So you do get that uh, lexical uh, scope where any any uh, code, any statement that's in between this outer scope and the, of, of this outer curly brace and this uh, outer ending curly brace would be a legal target. And since this inner function is defined in there, we actually can have access to data defined inside of Foo one. And that's ex exactly what Clojure is going to be. You're going to see that's exactly how we're going to end up using Clojure uh, later on in these slides as kind of a proto or primitive class. So then we have function. So function scope, as we already stated, is OK, we have a function here. We have fruit here that de is uh, defined just between these scopes. I can do a console log inside here. It would print out just fine. So if I run that code, it will display Apple, right? Inside function is Apple. However, if I tried to do a console.log on fruit, since this var was declared inside the function, it's not part of the global space. So this would actually throw an error for me. So I cannot access variables declared in functions. That's what it means to be function scope. It just so happens that uh, those var function scope variables can be declared out, uh, inside of like a global Windows function. Oh yeah, and so uh, and so I'll, I'll prove to you that the window is itself a function, which is why the, uh, the our variables can be a member to it. Uh, we'll take a look at how we can prove that in just a moment, and then block scope. I think you get the idea of this. This is this is pretty close to what Java is, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about uh, block scope versus function scope. Okay, so here let's talk about the operators and processing operations. So we'll talk about arithmetic operators, relational operators, equality operators, logical operators, bitwise operators, and others operators. These are all almost going to be exactly the same as they are in Java. So if you got good at using your operators in 1583 and continue to use them in 2120 and continue to use them in 2125, or if you use any in uh, C, for uh, system programming concepts for your like various labs, then you should be pretty OK with using them in JavaScript too. So we'll just quickly run through here. We have our addition, subtraction, our multiplication, our division, our modulus. And actually, we have one more primitive data type. We can, we can take the power of things. So if I wanted to take, for instance, 2 and get take 2 to the power of 4, right? I get 16. So a super easy way to be able to use the base and then the exponent power to produce a result. And again, because um, because this supports really big numbers, you can get, oh, that's a little too big. You can get really big results really quickly too, really rapidly. OK, so another thing I want to highlight, though, with arithmetic operators, I mentioned this before, and I promised I would come back to it when I got to this section. And so now I'm at the section, is that we can actually use Boolean values in our math, which is surprisingly uh, powerful in some ways that we need to express something. So 
Let's see how that might manifest. I might take 10 and I might multiply it by a true value. And so the true value is a non-zero number. So it just casts it as a one. True. So, so, so true results in one, which means that if I multiply it, it gives me 10. Now, if I go ahead and multiply it by false, it zeroes it out. So instantly you could see if I needed to oscillate or remove a number, instead of having to calculate how I can diminish that number, I can actually just multiply it uh, by a true or false or take it to the power of a true or false value. And it allows me this really flexible way to completely negate a number or to provide a number. So I know it seems strange, but this is uh, this ends up being pretty useful for expressing some kind of uh, numerical calculations. So it's good just to know that you can do this, that you can use true and false inside these arithmetic statements where you could not do that uh, in Java. So I do want to highlight that. Uh, the, uh, the rest of them work exactly the same. Relational operators are less than, greater than, less than or equal, greater than, equal, exactly the same, except that you're not just restricted to numerical data. You can actually evaluate strings and Boolean. So let's see what that looks like. So string, let's say I have A is less than B. Oh yeah, that's, that's true. If I flip it, oh, nope, that's false. Or I, I could say that uh, true is uh, greater than false. Yeah, since that turns into a number, that's, yeah, that's going to be the case. So you get as much power with your relational operators in JavaScript as you do with your quality. You, 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 you can use it for incredibly expressive comparisons. So that's our relational. Oh, I also want to highlight that uh, just like you can chain your operators in your arithmetic expressions, you could do it with your relational as well. So what I mean by that is I can say one is greater than two, is greater than three, is greater than four, and I can keep changing that, uh, uh, chaining that uh, or cascading that. If I at any point make one that's false, it'll cancel out and, and go false. So it doesn't have that clunky um, implementation that Java has where you would have to go like and, two is greater than three and three is greater than four right like this ends up being really clunky so there's something there's there's something eloquent about being able to very precisely cascade through your relational operators you can also do that with your equality operators too so you have two different types of equality operators actually you have equality and identity operators and you have inequality and non-identity operators so let me distinguish between these. An equality operator, and so this comes down to the fact that it's uh, the fact that we are a loosely typed language. So if I ask you the question, should the number one and the string one be equal? They both have the same value, but they're both two different data types. And so the answer to that question is actually yes and no. They are both equal and they're not equal depending on what you're looking for. If you care about the value, then they're equal. If you care about the value and how it's being treated as a data type, then they're not equal. So if you only care about equality of the value, then you use the double equal sign that produces true. If you care about the value and the data type, so if you, we want to actually ensure that type is part of our equality or our identity, I should say, then I'll add a third equal sign. So you see, it went from true to false. And so it's going to be the same thing for checking to see if it's not equal, right? Here to here. And so that's, that's going to, so they, it's typically suggested you use the identity operator as opposed to the equality operator to ensure that you have both type and uh, and that you have value. Uh, now, if you don't care about type, like let's say for instance, you're importing data from a text field and you just wanna to try to immediately cast that into a number or whatnot or, or compare it to a number, that's all right too, that's pretty common. But uh, uh, for, 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 for backend applications, typically you want to ensure that the type is matched on front end. You have a little bit more flexibility when you're getting, um, 
data from the uh, input fields, but definitely on the back end, try to adhere to these identity operators and not so much the uh, inequality operators. These also chain as well, by the way. So I could say one is equal to string of one, which is equal to the identity of uh, one, which is going to be false, because one of those is at least I do. There we go. Okay, let's see here. Uh, logical operators, I have my AND, which looks just like Java. I have my OR, which looks just like Java. I have my XOR, exclusive OR, which looks just like Java. I have my NOT, which just looks like Java. And I have a nullish coalescing. So I actually have a logical operator that Java does not. What does that mean? Okay, let's take a look what that means. So if I have a null and I have some other value like 10, it will give me the other value. So it might. So when I present it like this, it might not make sense. But if you have a value that might or might not exist, so you want to have a backup default value, then you would use this nullish coalescing and allows you to use this value if it exists. And if it doesn't, this would be the default thing that it returns back. Let me see. Can I also do undefined? And no. Oh, wow. It returns the null over un undefined. Let's see about NAN. Returns a NAN over that. Let's see, 10. Yeah, okay, perfect. Let's do, can I do NAN versus uh, zero? And it'll give me, so the NAN is actually treated as a numerical number. Good to know. Okay, the bitwise operators, exactly as you probably use them in C. So it allows you to shift uh, your bits leftwise Right-wise, uh, right-wise unsigned allows you to be able to do a uh, binary math doing AND operations, bitwise OR operations, and bitwise XOR operations. I don't want to spend too much time on this because this isn't systems. But you could do your systems homework inside JavaScript. And then finally, concatenation is uh, essentially anything that's not a number plus Another thing that's on a number or a number, and it's going to produce concatenation. So concatenation is done just like it is in, uh, in Java. And we also have that conditional operator where we can have something that's either true or false here, question mark, and then this is the thing that we want to resolve true. This is the thing we want to resolve false. Again, this uh, trinary or uh, um, operator, exactly as it is in Java. So don't want to spend too much time. OK, so let's talk about type checking and casting. So if I want to check the type of something, I can just do type of one. And notice here, if I were to type that in the console, it gives me back the data type number. I could do type of, and then I give it the string, and it tells me string. If I do type of true, it goes and tells me bully. This is an illustration. Remember how I said earlier that things, technically everything's an object in JavaScript, but some things are like first order objects, some things are special objects that don't get branded as objects, they get branded as something else. Here we can actually see how JavaScript is labeling that for us. So we can see that it actually identifies that as a number. It identifies this as a string. It identifies this as a Boolean. It identifies the math class that automatically gets imported to us or the math object as an object. Here, I could say type of window. Remember, window is the thing we initially launch into. That gets identified as a function object, so first order object. But it's a its own type of data type, its own type of data type called a function. And so this is why we have that global names, uh, that global space or that global scope. Is that whenever you declare a variable, it gets hoisted up. Uh, I'll talk about what hoisting means in a moment. It gets hoisted up to the uh, uh, the, the, the function it's currently defined within. And so if you don't define it in a function, well, the, the workspace that you start in, the Windows object, is actually a function object. So that means your variables will get declared within that space. If I want to ask the type of null, well, that's actually an object. Whereas the type of undefined is a special primitive uh, uh, first order object called an undefined. If I wanted to actually see what the type of NAND was, well, it actually counts as a number. So it's no different than any other number, which is why it doesn't break our arithmetic operations. So it, it's able to translate into the numerical space the concept of not being a number, but still count as a number. 
Okay, so let's talk about instance though. We have methods like this inside Java, being able to check the type of something, to be able to check the instance of something. We can do that. We haven't really started learning object-oriented and classes in JavaScript yet. We're gonna do that in a future lecture. So I just kind of want to show you what this means in terms of our primitive data type. So if I say, hey, is null an instance of object, it's going to say false. No, it's not, because it's its own special thing. Even though it, it, it claims to be an object, it's, it's, it's not an object object. Uh, is Windows an, an, a window an instance of object? Oh, that's true. It is an object. Is window an instance of function? That's true, too. Is uh, undefined an instance of object? Nope, that's false is 100 an instance of a number. And so here's where I want to highlight the fact that the number class, the Boolean class, and the string class are going to be different than the primitive data type of the first, uh, the first order um, object of number, Boolean, and string that are our, uh, our primitive data types. So if I actually say, is 100 an instance of number, that's actually false is true an instance of Boolean, that's false, and is hello an instance of string, that's false. Because these belong to our primitive type, not to our uh, not to the type that we're casting with a uh, constructor. Oh, okay, let's talk about casting actually, now that we're here. So we said that there's three types of primitive data and that we can cast them all between one another. And there's two ways I can cast, I could either use kind of like these uh, constructors, number, boolean, and string, or I can use these symbols to do the same thing this does. So let's take a look at this. Let me refresh this. So uh, let's do number first. So if I take a string and I have numbers in there, I can just go ahead and say, okay, I want to turn this into a number. So essentially, it's going to pass it right into there. It's special method. It's not a constructor. It's a method or a function. I should say a function. It's a function that will cast this string into a number. Or I can pass it a, um, a true value or a false value. Or I can pass it um, a binary value, right? OK, so this is how we cast other data types into numbers. How do we cast into Boolean? Uh, we just use Boolean, the function Boolean. And so here I can say I want, uh, right, that's going to be true. This will be false, right? Uh, Null would be false. Um, undefined would be false. And would be false. Okay, let's say, uh, but so uh, remember though that if I type in false, that'll still be true. If I do a empty array, which we'll talk about later, that's going to be true. That means that uh, that actually exists. There's actually a reference to an array. If I do like an empty object, that'll actually be a true too. And then, oh, and another way that I can cast actually is to do um, uh, not not or exclamation mark, exclamation mark. So if I do that and then I pass in a empty string, it'll cast that into a Boolean. If I put uh, a string that has text in there, if I do um, over some of the others, uh, there we go, you cast that, or null, or any of the other ones. So if you just want a quick and rapid way to cast some type of data into a Boolean, you can use exclamation, exclamation. If you want to do it with the number, oh, I didn't show you the plus sign. So if I just do the plus sign, I don't have to use number. So here, let me do a number, and I must have a letter in there because it became not a number. There it is, and it's, there we go. Same thing, if I do plus true, it'll go ahead and turn that into a one for me. So you can cast any value into a number, even if it can't be a number, just convert into NAND. And then if you want to do a string, well, you could either do the two string method or you could do the, um, what I showed you before, you could use the template and just pass your data in there. So where's my dollar sign? So I could just put like a, um, a number in here and notice that's now a string. Let's see here. If I had um, if I had a number and I let's see, sure. If I have a number, I can invoke two string on it. 
got to be a way to, well, I guess that's the easiest way is just to do this approach. Um, here, this approach where you use the string template and you just pass your data in. And then if you want to do a calculation, you can do your calculation. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so that's that's how we can cast, uh, but very similar rules as Java. So uh, let's talk about our control, control flow. We have single selections, we have double selections, we have multi selections, which consists of either either nested if else or switch statements. We have uh, while loops, we have do while loops, we have for loops. Okay, so pretty much we have continue statements, we have break statements. Almost everything that you're used to, we even have enhanced for loops, which are going to look slightly different, but they're conceptually the same. So let's quickly run through this. This is going to look almost exactly like Java. So if, and then inside parentheses, you have some expression that results to be true, then we can open up a code block and put some, uh, some collection of statements in there. Single selection looks identical to what you do in Java. Double selection, identical to what you do in Java. If inside the parentheses, you have some uh, Boolean expression, you have a code block for the if, then you do an else, code block for the else, exactly the same as what you're used to. Let's take a look at multi-selection, exactly the same. If, and then you have a Boolean expression, block of code for that um, selection, then an else if, and then a Boolean expression because you have an if statement there, then a block of code for that expression, and then you go all the way down until you have some default value that could be an else, whether you need it or not, you don't need the else, just like you don't need in Java, or you could have it. Uh, let's take a look at the switch statements. Switch statements look exactly as they do in Java. I can go ahead and declare using the word switch, and then I have a set of parentheses where I can pass in some value. Then I create a code block. Inside the code block, I can define a uh, collection of cases. If my case is option one, with the colon exactly as we do in Java, I can process some result. Like, so I could take this string and I can concatenate A, and then I break out of there. Got to definitely use those break statements, just like I do in Java, to break out of the switch statement. Otherwise, I cascade down. Otherwise, if case is option two, then I'll take and concatenate to my result B, and then I have a default case, just like I do in Java. So if I print out the result of this, it should be B. And if I forget my break statements, just like in Java, it cascades down, it produces all the results. And again, you can do almost any type of data in your case statements here. And remember, case statements, I'll uh, check for equality. If you didn't learn selection statements, that's fine. We almost never use them. You could always use uh, nested switch statements. Sometimes they're nice because it can consolidate code, but you know you get the same behavior with these nested if else's. Let's talk about our for loops. So our for loops, exactly the same as what Java looks like. I have a loop control variable that I create. I'm using let so that it exists in block scope. I am going to go ahead and evaluate my loop control variable here, and I'll increment my, or I'll update my loop control variable here. And then I block a code associated with my for loop that does some logic. So this is a counter controlled loop. So I'm controlling all the logic right si inside the for loop. So remember, we typically use for loops when we know that there's a certain number of count that we want to do. We have enhanced for loops. We have what's called the for in loop. So instead of having to set up a loop control variable, I can have an array. We, so I'm going to show you how to do an array. Arrays are super simple. We have essentially like an initializer list, and we can have a number of elements separated by commas. We'll assign this into an array. So our array is A, B, and C here holding those strings. I'll have this result, which is just an empty string. So I'll say, let i in array, and then I'm going to process that. And so for each element in the array, i is going to manifest itself as the index. So a, a for in loop will give you the index of each element inside the list. So notice my output here is 0, 1, 2. I can also do a for of loop. So I'm going to produce this empty string. I'm going to create create this array here with elements a b and c and i'm going to do for i and again i always got to initialize my or i declare my loop control variable inside my block here so let i of array and then i'll take whatever i is for each element in my array and i'll i'll go ahead and concatenate that on results and notice i'll actually get the element the d reference from the array so i have control with enhanced for loops without having to manage my own iterator to be able to either get the index or get the uh, get the element, uh, whichever 
I need to do. So if I need to read it, I'll do the element. If I need to write into it, I would do the index so that I can index back into the array and actually update the space inside of memory. OK, let's talk about our Sentinel control loops. These are our while loops, things that we don't know how long they should run. I have, well, that's going to look just like Java, right? So here, I'll create results. And so uh, this is a string. Strings maintain their own length. You can actually, I believe you could do this in Java too, uh, query a string on its length. Uh, so while the length of result is less than 20 characters, I will concatenate. So remember with while loops, you have to update, update your uh, loop control variable, which is going to be result in this case. So I'm declaring my loop control variable. I'm evaluating my loop control variable. And then I'm updating my loop control variable. As soon as my result gets to be more than 20 characters, I will knock out of it. And I will put my result along with that man. So no, 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 no. And here we'll do a do while loop exactly like it is in Java. I preface with do. I have my code block. I, I end with while. I can have a true or false value. The advantage of a do while loop is it, it guarantees the execution of my uh, loop logic at least once before evaluating to see if it's going to loop again, whereas a traditional while loop might not execute its set of instructions at all. So and it looks exactly the same. OK, so continues and breaks work exactly as they do in Java. So here, let me just create a quick uh, basic for loop. But whenever i is equal to 5, I will break out of the loop, which means that once I get to 4, that'll be the last value because I broke the loop after that. Perfect. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, because I was adding the index to this result string. Let's take a look at. Uh... So let me explain. Um, the continue, then I'll, I'll redefine what the equal, 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 the identity is. So this right here is the identity. That means that I am looking at I for not only being the same value of, but the same data type. Remember that JavaScript is a uh, loosely typed language, which means that the, I don't, I'm not, I'm not necessarily guaranteed that any value I'm looking at is a numerical value. And sometimes I want that to. Uh, so sometimes I want that to be uh, true. Sometimes I don't. But for safety caution, you should always use identity if that's if if you're it's supposed to be both a number and a value. Okay, let's talk about the uh, the continue. Works just like in Java. So I'm going to iterate from zero to ten increment each time. Whenever i mod three is a non-zero value, because remember I can take numerical values and uh, treat them as Boolean expressions. So anything that is non-zero is true. Anything that is zero is false. So at zero, this would be uh, false. So I would skip the continue statement, and I would add zero to result. Then I would iterate this to one. And then one mod three is one. That means it's a truth value. I continue, which means I stop the execution of the loop here, but then iterate my iterator to two, and then try again. So then two would continue, then three. Three mod three is going to be zero, which means I'm not going to do the continue statement. I'll do the result, and that's going to give me a zero, three, six, nine. Essentially, anything that's divisible by three with or gives me a modulus result of zero will appear in my uh, console.log. Perfect. Let's talk about functions. There's three different ways we can declare functions, and you've already seen some in what I showed you. Uh, functions, I think, are super easy to go ahead and uh, declare in JavaScript. And like, and since JavaScript, so, so up to now, what we've seen has been um, um, uh, imperative uh, programming. It's just been a collection of statements, but not contained in functions. So now we can start creating procedural programs, start organizing with a procedural approach. We can create functions. Now, the thing that separates functions from methods from a software engineering perspective, is functions are not defined in classes. As soon as you start defining functions in a class, it becomes the name of a method. So if you ever wondered what's the difference between a method and a function, well, it, it depends on whether it exists inside or outside of a class. As soon as you start designing a class, all the behaviors defined within the class are methods. Any function that's defined at just the base level of your code base that's not contained in some other kind of structure, data structure like a class, would be a function. So, so here we're going to talk about function, both function declarations, function expressions, and arrow functions. So we implement a function just with the keyword function. Super simple. We don't have to declare a return type. 
if we want something to return, we just use the return statement to return data. So by default, if you don't declare a return statement, one is implicitly uh, defined for you, returning undefined. So whenever you see these undefined crop up in the interpreter window, it's telling you that you did a you got a callback and you weren't returned any data. So I can technically, if I wanted to, assign that undefined value if I wanted to. It wouldn't make any sense. So here's a function I called foo. And it has the parameter list. I send input into my parameter list. But in this instance, I leave it empty because I don't want input. I define a code block to my function. And then I can do instructions. And then to invoke that function, I could just invoke its name. Typically, you'd also want to have your semicolon. But I want to highlight the fact that those were optional. So I invoked it here to print out hello by just using the name. And you invoke it the same way you do in Java. And essentially, you define them. It's even a simpler, I think, syntax in Java. Let's say you do need a parameter. Uh, here's an example of a function, foo, and I pass in a parameter. Since this is a loosely typed language, I don't need to put a data type. I just put a label for that local variable so we can access it inside the function block. And so here, and so essentially it will become a variable type is essentially what it is. Um, and so because it exists for the entirety of this function. And so now I can access that value passed in here, print it out. So if I do foo and buy, it prints that out. Now, suppose that I did want to have a return statement. So you saw I got undefined here, I got undefined here. I can define a function. I can define the uh, name for this function. My parentheses, it has a parameter in, a function body. I do provide a return statement where I modify this value passed in and just multiply it by five. And so now, when I invoke that function, I can assign that value to a variable, and that, that output value would be 500. So instead of undefined, like I got here and here, since I did issue a return statement, I actually get a return value back that I can bind to a variable. But it's that easy. I just, I just explicitly give a return value, and I can start returning data out of functions. So I think slightly easier than how we do this in Java. Uh, OK, so what's the difference between a function declaration and a function expression? Well, a function expression could be a function that is assigned to a variable. So just like we can assign data to variables, since functions are technically objects, we can actually assign functions to objects as well. And there's a reason why we, we might want to do this. Uh, we can declare it as constant, and it prevents us from accidentally overwriting our function. Because you can redeclare a function since it would be in the global namespace. And we already saw that you can redeclare variables. Well, that rule is true with functions. So if you want to ensure that you declare a function that cannot be overridden, then it makes more sense to create a function expression that is defined as constant. And that way, it can never accidentally be overridden. Uh, it also prevents hoisting, which I'm about to explain in just a few moments. So here. I, but everything else is going to look the same. So I'm going to create a variable, a uh, constant value called foo, and I will assign to it a anonymous function, essentially. So a function with parameters, it has a body, it's the exact same implementation, and then I can invoke it the same way. So when I invoke it, you don't know the difference on whether it was a function expression or a function declaration. One exists inside the global scope. I mean, I guess they both, in this instance, uh, uh, exist in the global scope, but one's a constant and the other is not. And so uh, it looks exactly the same if I use uh, parameters. It looks exactly the same if I return statements. Uh, the only difference is that it's an anonymous function that's now bind it to a constant uh, memory address as opposed to something that was just simply declared inside of our global space. And then we have our arrow functions, which is a compressed way of expressing our functions. So an arrow function, so let's take a look at this. So our function before we had our parentheses, and then our method body, and then the contents of our method body. So we have the same thing. It's a function expression. So I'm going to create a constant called foo, and then I'm going to do an assignment. And so this is our parameter list, These, this, uh, this empty parameter list here. And then this is going to go to the fat arrow that then does whatever the body of code is. If it's more than one statement, you would use a block to define the fat arrow. Since this was a single line, I can do that single line without defining a block. But if it's more than one line, you do have to define a block. Uh, and so look at how nice and clean you can define your functions that are pretty simple, one line of code. And then I invoke it, I get the same 
that I got from the previous two declarations in the function expression. So let's say if I want data, I put the data variable there and then I do my fat arrow and then I go ahead and print that and it looks exactly the same. And if I want to return something, notice I do not need a return statement with a fat arrow function. The last statement is, so you can put a return statement. Uh, you can explicitly put in a return statement, but if you do not put a return statement in a fat arrow function, it implicitly adds the last statement as your return statement. And so this is a typical strategy in functional programming paradigms. So if you were to program in Scala, for instance, Scala does the same thing. If you don't uh, explicitly give a return statement, it will implicitly add one as the last statement. And so this is this is where we start treating JavaScript as a functional programming language using uh, fat arrow functions uh, on this order, which allows us to start streaming through things and cascading data or chaining data calls into data calls. Okay, so one thing I do have to highlight on functions is that they do not support overloading. So this is a big distinction between Java and JavaScript. So in JavaScript, they opt to have uh, default values. I mean, yeah, default values. So in, for instance, here, I can create a function called foo, and I can have x, but then I can assign it if the user doesn't already give it a value. So I'm going to assign it hello, and then I'm going to do console.log x. And then I'll call foo without any parameters, and it says hello. Because I didn't give it any value, it's going to assume to use the default value. If I did provide a value, it'll all go ahead and print that out. So foo by will print out by. If I try to declare two functions like this with the same name but different parameters, look what happens. If I try to invoke the first one, it doesn't do anything because I overwrote that function. That's the dangerous thing about functions is if you try to overload it, all you're going to do is overwrite it. Not write it, but overwrite it. You'll mutate it. You'll redefine it. Which is why it's safe to use the uh, the const. If we try to do this with a const and say, oh, you can't use that name. You so if you want different behaviors on functions, your options are either to use default values or to create functions with different names. Those are your two avenues. Okay, this is the last part of my lecture: closures and hoisting. So these are my advanced uh, scoping uh, techniques. So hoisting in JavaScript is JavaScript's default behavior of moving all the declarations to the top of the current scope. So to the top of the current script or the current function. And by current script, we mean the window uh, function. So JavaScript's initializations are not hoisted. So initializations, things that are assigned are not hoisted, only those things that are declared. So global vars and function are hoisted to the top of our global scope into the window function, and vars are hoisted to the top of their function scope. Let and cons variables are not hoisted. So what does that mean? It means this. If I create this function foo, and I try to print out the value of z, and then I initialize this c here, and then try to call foo, notice it doesn't print out anything. It's undefined. The reason why it doesn't do it is because I tried to initialize it right? Initialized variables do not get hoisted. If I create a function foo, I assign it here, but declare it here, right? This is weird, out of order. I'm going to assign it before I declare it. I'm going to print it out before I actually declare it, but it works. And that's because when Java goes and reads this function into memory, it checks for any declarations, not in the initializations, but declarations, and it populates that to the top. And it does that at the global space. It does that at the function space. Anything that's declared a var, anything that's declared a function, not a function expression, but a function declaration, are hoisted to the top of your application. So var is hoisted to the nearest function, if not defined in a function, is within the global space. And let and const are not. So if I tried to do the same thing with const, if I tried to go ahead and assign a value and print it out before declaring it, I'm going to get this area. error. Cannot access x before initialization. So again, this is this instance, if you want variables that behave like they do in Java, use let. If you want, uh, if you want uh, behaviors like um, variables or functions where you could declare them anyway, where, and they kind of propagate to the top, then that's, that's how function and, and var are, are defined. But if you're going to use these, it's a good practice to go ahead and declare these at the top from the get-go so other developers or you in the future can read and see what's happening. 
And so let me just give uh, an example of, uh, of uh, function hoisting. So here I have foo, where I'm actually, I, I'm, 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 I'm calling on foo before I define it, right? So here is my invocation of foo, and then I'm defining it underneath it, but it works fine. Now, if I try to do the same thing with a function expression, remember function expressions are essentially initialization, so they don't get hoisted. If I try to invoke bar, and I declare bar here, after I try to evoke it, it's going to give me this error. You cannot access bar before initialization. So again, if you want to have an ordering in ensuring that everything is declared before you try to invoke it, then you get that safety by using ex function expressions and not function declarations. This is what I was kind of alluding to earlier. And so the last thing I, I, I just want to highlight in today's lecture is closures. And cl all closures are are nested functions. So we, it's possible for us to embed one function inside of another function because functions are objects, which means they, they can ha be assigned values. And since closures are super useful because it allows us to associate data inside the outer function that then gets used by the inner function. So there's that lexical environment with a function that operates on that data. And so this obviously has parallels to object-oriented programming, where you can create an instance of something that has both attributes and the behaviors that just affect those attributes. Think of this as a, a very primitive or simplified version of this, where you don't want to have to define an entire class. Now, we do have mechanisms to define classes. I'll get into object-oriented uh, JavaScript and uh, that, that supports inheritance and whatnot uh, in a future lecture. But here, this will give us something that's very kind of object light, but when it needs to be simple. And so to give you a, uh, so to give you just an example of how this look, might look, I'm going to show it to you in both the fat arrow function, which is compressed logic or as a function expression. I could have done this as a function declaration as well. But here I will create a uh, adder uh, constant and I'll assign that an anonymous function the, where that has a nested function. So the outer function, will take in an x and then have a function body and then the inner function is going to return itself this anonymous function that takes a y and returns x which is provided from the outer function plus y which is provided by the inner function so i know what you're you're thinking this is a really weird syntax i'm hoping that the other example is going to make sense so let me give you an example of how we would actually use this i would then take adder and pass it five that five is my x value so that x value is then, so I return back this function, a function that takes in a y and returns, since I pass in x as 5 here, it would be 5 plus y. And so now, bind it to this variable name called add 5 will now be a function itself that whenever I pass a value into it, it will always add 5 to. Now, let's say I need another function that's similar in behavior, but uses a different value of x. If I invoke adder and then for my x value pass in 10 and then bind that to a new function expression called add 10, I can now invoke this new function, pass 2 into that, and that's going to give me 12. And so if I want to express that as a fat arrow function, I think it's much cleaner in my opinion, I would do a nesting of arrows. So when I go to do my function expression here, my first input is an x which then leads to a second uh, function, which takes in a y, which returns an x plus y. So I then can create my add five by same way I do here. I essentially invoke the adder method, which contains a nested function. I'll pass in five as the initial x value. And now whenever I evoke that with the two, it will add five. Or if I add 10, it will add, uh, it'd be 15. Uh, if I do adder 10, it will now set my x value to 10. So if I invoke that as a function itself with a new value, it will always use that x value. Does that make sense? Does closures kind of make sense? And do you kind of see how this kind of resembles a kind of primitive form of an object? Okay, so this was a lot of data, but the point is uh, I'm gonna make these slides available and I'm recording everything so you can rewatch. But I'd like to think that most of what we covered today although maybe at a high speed, is relatively what you're familiar with already. And so the idea is that you'll get a chance to rewatch this. You'll get a chance to get through my slides. And what I'm going to do, what I think I'm going to do with this section for the basics, is I'm going to give you a quiz that'll quiz you on some of these 
uh, principles where I might give you expressions and you have to determine what how they'll evaluate. And then likely what I'll do for the homework for this will be coding problems more similar to your Java 1 labs, where you will attach your solutions to an HTML file and just print out the results in the console as console logs. And that way you could just kind of open the HTML, it imports your script, and then it'll run through and produce all the solutions to some essentially lab problems that I'll produce. So with that said, is there any questions that anyone has about JavaScript? What, like, what's your opinions of it? Does it look close enough to Java where you feel like you'll essentially be able to hit the ground running with this? Yeah, and it'll be one of these things that um, the more you practice, the more um, the more you practice with it, the more comfortable you'll get with it. Uh, I think that there's certainly advantages that JavaScript have, has over Java, and then I think there's definitely advantages Java has over JavaScript. But that's like that with any programming language. But I think everyone having a foundation in Java will definitely behoove us moving forward with JavaScript. So that's our JavaScript basics. It pretty much covered. I pretty much covered the first half of Java one in an hour and fifteen minutes. Uh, no, so the quiz is not posted yet. I'll I'll let you know. I mean, I probably won't post a quiz until after uh, the the Bootstrap Lab is uh, technically done. So probably not till next Tuesday. That way, the, there's only like one thing at a time, and like I can go through. And so now that I did, went through uh, this this entire um, this entire PowerPoint slide. If there's any questions that anyone has, I'll, I'll make it available uh, sometime today. Go through it and formulate questions. And I could take the first uh, couple of minutes, like the first 10 or 15 minutes of next lecture, to be able to give more vivid examples inside the interpreter uh, for anything that might not make sense. Uh, I have a tough time trying to decide what to spend a lot of information on, because from my perspective, a lot of the syntax and this, a lot of the logic that's happening here is super similar to uh, Java. So like the, I think the one big distinction is the fact that you can nest functions, declarations inside of other functions, which you can't do in Java because you don't actually have functions in Java. You only have methods. Everything has to be defined inside of a class with Java. Okay. So if there's, if there's, if there's no other questions, then I will go ahead and uh, end our lecture today. Let me go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>